Good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to be back to the farm. Uh, my name is James Peng. I'm the founder and the CEO of Pony AI. We are a company that focused on developing the safest, most reliable, and scalable solutions for autonomous driving. Thanks for Professor for inviting me to here, and thanks for the kind introduction. Today, I want to take this opportunity to really share with you some of the experience that we had during the last two years. Uh, I want to first start with telling you the in potential impact of autonomous driving, aka why did we choose this field to start as uh, our, our new company. Then I'll probably spend the time to, to give some of you a, a autonomous driving 101, really a crash course. So what is, does it mean? What's the myth of this field? And then at the end, uh, of course, I, I, by being the CEO, I'll, I'll try to advertise, tell you a bit about our journey so far. So I'll start with the potential impact of autonomous driving. Why did we choose this field? Essentially, some of you, I, I will show up, all of you have had experience with the current transportation system. It's neither safe, efficient, nor enjoyable. Uh, there's a lot of issues, problems associated with the current system. Right? It's first, uh, uh, roads are very congested. It's not efficient. Most of this are deal, deal, uh, uh, associated with, for example, uh, in the city traffic, the intersections actually account for more than 30% of the delay in our mobility. But without a smart traffic light controlling system, without uh, really the system being automated and uh, optimized, the, the, the congestion and the cost is inevitable. Also, the traffic itself is not safe enough. Right? Um, in fact, there's a statistics that 93, more than 93% of the fatal accidents are associated with human errors. Right? You can imagine the, the, uh, the driver can get tired, there's a DUI, uh, there's emotional factors associated with this. And also, you really look at the human, our sensors are our eyes, and our sensor only has the coverage of about 120 degrees. So we definitely have a lot of the blind spots we cannot cover. <coughs> Out of all this, also the current transportation system re still relies, heavily relies on the internal combustion engine, and also because of the congestion, the system are not efficient. So we, we actually all want to imagine a word which is a lot better than this, right? In, in your, I guess in your spare times or in some dreaming times, you probably think about you want a transportation system that's a less congested, that's a lot safer on the road, and also the efficiency is much higher. Right? Just, just imagine, I, I think the last month, actually just this Monday, you probably wished you had a uh, autonomous driving with you so that instead of focusing on the road condition when you go to work or go to st school, you can actually, in your car, snatching all the Cyber Monday deals. Right? <laughs> That's potential productivity increase from the autonomous driving is just enormous because on average, people spend more than two hours on the road and if you free up that time doing something more productive, the whole society will be much better. So that's why, because of the huge impact, we picked this area as the, the area that we started, the pony journey. So, so think about the, just rest a bit and think about what the future can be. I, I'm sure a lot of you read the news that in the last five, 10 years, the home mobility related field is very exciting, right? There's a one, one access, there's a, a, 
a whole transformation of the business model, right? Traditionally, the car OEMs, the majority of their revenue comes from selling vehicles. And now with the emergence of Uber, Lyft, and DD, and the like, all the OEMs are thinking of changing the car selling business into a service-based model. So the ride sharing becomes a more popular form of transportation. And then on the other angle, you look at there's a lot of new forms of transportation coming up. I'm sure you read, read about autonomous driving vehicles. There's autonomous flying cars. There's a Hyperloop right? and, and uh, many, many other forms. So, so you can imagine in the next five to 10 years, the whole mobility related field <coughs> will be very exciting. And I, my personal view is all these forms of transportation has its need, has its place in the future mobility. Right? The, the Hyperloop, the, the, the high speed rail probably will be the 500 mile-ish transportation, be, be the majority uh, takers for that. And then the way for, say, say, for example, the ride from here to airport will be something like a Hyperloop or, or a really, if you're really in a hurry, it, it will be the flying cars. But majority, majority of the transportation will still handle a, in the local commute, right? You go to work, you go to a shopping, and that will still be handled by the autonomous driving vehicles. It's because of that, and, and you probably, all of you heard about AI. AI is sort of the buzzword of the day. And this AI booming, in, in fact, let, let me step one, one step back. AI had many booms and busts before, right? The, the, in fact, the last booming was in the uh, early 90s. That's actually when I started learning computer science. The, ex, the expert system was the buzzword. But what made this AI booming different than the previous ones was this is the one where AI technology is actually being used in the real industry to transform the existing system. And among all the potential industry that can be transformed by AI technology, this is a, a report done by uh, earlier this year by McKinsey that all the top industry that can be or will be transformed by AI are uh, all mobility related. That just shows you how vast is this field will be. In fact, because of that promise in the investment community, it's also become very hard. Uh, this is just shows you the trend over several years. Uh, the average size and the total amount of investment poured into autonomous driving related companies. Uh, it's not just the total amounts, it's the average deal size is also increased. In fact, in the last two years, more than half of the investment was from uh, corporate players. That means the big car OEMs and the tech giants start noticing the potential of this technology and start heavily invested in this. Just a case in point, uh, this is uh, in the summer, Morgan Stanley come up with a report that put a potential value to Waymo at a whopping 175 billion plus. Uh, this show, uh, just shows you that the whole investment community sees the potential of the field. So, so I, since this is not the majority of my talk, I'll just glimpse through, just shows you what's the potential impact of all this and, and why we are interested in this. Then I'll spend some time to tell you what, what, what autonomous driving really mean. Uh, I want to be, again, I want to be a little faster in my presentation. If you have any questions, please do feel free to, to ask and uh, I'll, I'll try to leave more time at the end for, for Q&A. So when you think about autonomous driving, you, you might think of something like this, a very futuristic looking vehicles with completely redesigned of the current vehicles. This might be the case in 10 years, maybe in five. But these days, 
rather, most of the uh, autonomous driving vehicles look like this. It's a retrofitting of the existing vehicles we, by putting on different types of sensors, by putting a computer into the vehicle, and then load it with advanced AI algorithms. And then we can let the computers to drive the vehicle instead of uh, driving by a human. So the typical sensors that put in the vehicle are stuff like a GPS and IMU. Um, it's actually in all our smartphones, we have GPS and IMU. IMU is the initial measurement. Uh, but what's used in the vehicle is just a lot more accurate and a lot more advanced than what's in our uh, smartphones. It can give the positioning of the vehicle a lot more accurate. In addition, we put on different types of sensors. There's a LiDAR. Well, the, the mechanism of a LiDAR is actually quite straightforward. Essentially, it's a device. It, it's sort of like the wrench finder that, that people use to measure the size of a room. Right? Essentially, it's emitting a, a light laser line and by either measure the time of travel Right? You, you, you measure the time, divide by two, that's the distance. Or there's a new types of LiDAR comes in by measuring the frequency change and, and, the, and the other things. Then there's uh, some other types of sensors. There's uh, uh, traditionally, there's camera, because camera is cheap and the camera can has high resolution. And also there's a radar, the millimeter radar, that can actually accurately detect the speed of moving objects. There, uh, definitely, there's new types of sensor coming in. So you can think of that essentially is equipped the vehicle with eyes, with ears, so that it can detect what's around it. That, then the next question you might ask is, then why now, right? Uh, you, you probably read about autonomous driving. The history of it is that as early as Back in the, in, in the World War II, that's 80 years ago, people were, people were already dreaming about or thinking about autonomous driving. But why it took so long? And what happened in the last five years that made this possible? In, in fact, I think it's s several things. It's not just one thing. I think it's several things happened roughly in, in this time frame that made, made this become possible. The first one is uh, the vehicle technology is advanced. In the old form of a vehicle, when we actually turn the wheel, the wheel itself will actuate the actuator to do the turning. Right? When we brake, it's, a, it's the same thing. But in the modern vehicle, essentially we're not actu controlling the actuator directly, but rather when we turn the wheel, it was transformed into a digital signal. By measuring how much you turned, it, it's sending a different uh, signal to the vehicle. So that, in vehicle industry, we call drive-by-wire. Essentially, it's by the, the digital command. So you can imagine, in the old days, if you want a machine to drive a vehicle, the, the most ways, in fact, even the first or the second DARPA challenge, autonomous driving challenge, most of the uh, autonomous driving vehicle was done by adding a new actuator into the vehicle. But in these days, essentially you can imagine that we can add a device in there by sending the same signal into the vehicle and uh, control the vehicle. So the drive-by-wire system is, is the first factor. The second is the uh, computer chips and the computing power is getting a lot better a lot better than before. That's thanks to the Morse law. So the onboard computer these days can handle a much more complicated algorithms. And then, the, the, as I mentioned, there's a new types of sensors, especially the emergence of LiDAR that makes the measurement a lot more accurate. Then I think, I think comes what's Next is the uh, big data algorithm and AI technology. So combining with the emergence of all these technologies, autonomous driving suddenly becomes possible. But doesn't mean it's easy, but at least now it becomes 
uh, uh, attainable. So then what is the definition of uh, autonomy in the vehicle? Uh, this, is the, this is just one type of uh, levels that are defined by SAE, is the Society of Auto uh, Automotive Engineers. Essentially, it's, it's, without knowing the details, you can think of uh, uh, what we talk about the high, high autonomous is mo mostly in the level four, level five. The main difference is level five, we're talking about all weather condition, all traffic conditions without any human intervention. Level four is still a very high automation, but it still requires some restrictions. For example, in a, in a very heavy rain, maybe even heavier than the rain we have today, then the vehicles might be out of service. But in most normal conditions, it will be fully autonomous. Uh, the level two is actually is more like a Tesla's uh, claimed automation. Essentially, it's something like a ACC, the adaptive cruise control. You do a lane keeping. You do uh, a, a, a automatic stop once you see an obstacle. And the level three is, is sort of in between. Then, uh, really, it, it's. I'm not trying to demystify the whole thing and, and trivialize it, but if you really think about how the, human, uh, how the computer drives a vehicle, it's actually very analogous to how human drives a vehicle. Right? For us, when we learn driving, it becomes so spontaneous, we probably don't even think about it and uh, dissect about what have happened in the driving. But if you think about it, it's really when we're driving, we are constantly asking ourselves several questions simultaneously. The first one is, where am I? Right? Which lane am I in? Uh, where am I going? Which the location am I? Right? The, the absolute and the relative location of ourselves is very important. And then the second question is, what is around us? Right? What is around it? There's two types of things around us. One is the static objects. The lane, the curb, the building, the traffic signs, the, the traffic lights, and whatnot. And then there's another road agents that are moving. There's vehicles, there's pedestrians, there's cyclists, and whatnot. Right? So, so we're constantly keeping track of all the objects, all the obstacles around us. And then the third question is, then what will they do next? for all the mov moving ones. Will this vehicle cut in, in front of me? Will this vehicle turn right? Will this one have any interaction with our f uh, path? Right, so, so, so the, this is related with prediction. And then the next one is based on all this information we collected, what will I do next? Right, this essentially comes to the decision come to the decision point and say, what should I do? Should I brake? Should I accelerate? Should I turn? Then the, the, the final question is, the, the, what, do, what should I do to execute? Right? By using our hand or feet to control the, turning, uh, the steering wheels or the brakes or, 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 or the gas. So this related with the five fields, directly related with the five fields in the autonomous driving, which is localization, Perception, prediction, planning, and then control. So essentially, you can think that that's basically by adding eyes, brains, hands, and feet to the vehicle, then control it. Then related to enable all this being possible, then we add simulation, uh, mapping, different sensor fusion, and, and all the other related fields. So, so all this sounds simple, but, but in reality, what makes uh, uh, driving a lot harder than the, a lot of other AI systems is twofold. One is the uh, autonomous driving is directly, directly related with safety. So precision, safety, reliability are very important. 99.99% probably is definitely not good enough. 
Right? It requires very high precision. And the second <coughs> problem or second challenge is just the open road condition. It's just so unpredictable and so complex. It's probably com more complicated than most of the automated system that human ever dealt with. So, so to illustrate that, I'll, I'll just give you, first give you some small, uh, short videos, some snippets of the uh, traffic scenarios that we have encountered during our road tests. Of course, this is just a very small snippet. What we actually have encountered are far more complicated. So this one is, shows you a uh, vehicle cutting. You can see we are following, uh, I'll orient you a little bit. This is how the census, uh, census view, this is the camera view, this is the LiDAR view. So, so we, we are actually behind that big vehicle. Let me restart this. So essentially, we are, we are following that big vehicle. And you can notice there's a vehicle in the right lane. And then on the left lane, there's a vehicle first approaching. But then this vehicle decides to, to cut in uh, in, a, in a very short distance. So, so essentially, our vehicle needs to detect this, slow down. And once that vehicle is changed lane, we have a safe distance between the, us and the front vehicle. We sp we've sped up. Right, so, so this is the, the whole situation that we need to deal with. And then uh, another a scenario where it's in a foggy, rainy day. We see a, a green light. We're doing our business coming in, but then there's a, a motorcycle that apparently ran through a, a, a red light and get in front of us. So th th that field of view, that detection needs to be happening. Uh, fast enough in order to avoid accidents. Then there could be people in the in the reverse side of the traffic, right? Just uh, uh, just mind his own business. <laughs> right? In this case, we actually slow down. We can't change lane because there's a vehicle in the right hand side. So all we can do is to nudge over it, right? So so the nudging is important. Uh, there's Another case where we are following a big vehicle so that we think it's just following it. But out of nowhere, there's also a, a, a vehicle travel in the reverse, reverse side of the, the road. And in this case, we cannot nudge over it because it's already in the lane. So we have to st stop and find another way out. Right. So this is a night scenario with a J walk worker comes in because of the uh, construction, we actually can't see the, that, that pedestrian coming in. So, so, so essentially, we have to detect in time to avoid the, the accident. In fact, we, we see it again. Uh, we, we can see, we, we actually detect it and, and uh, send a snow signal, slow down, slow down to, to the vehicle. Anyhow, just give you a glimpse of what, in reality, what we need to deal with in the open road, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you have encountered some near miss or even encountered uh, some accidents. You can see the driving situation on the open road is just far more complicated than what's in a controlled environment. So I'll spend another probably 15 minutes tell you a bit about Pony AI what we have done, um, then, then we'll all open for Q&A. Um, in fact, before I talk about the, what we, our journey, um, one of the most asked questions that we had is about why this name? People, people always, why this name? So, so, so essentially, be, uh, during the time when we started the company, we wanted a name that's meaningful, memorable, a, a name that's cute, or ha at least has some real meaning associated with it, right? Our, our vision is to revolutionize the transportation system. So we wanted a name that can capture the scale or the meaning of what we wanted to do. Uh, then 
we think about the name, right? What, what the, what's the earliest form of transportation is really the horse dragged uh, carriage. That's, then it's, we come seeing the internal combustion engine, then, then the vehicle industry. So, so I think the pony is actually directly associated with the transportation with mobility. Of course, another hope, secret hope we had was that pony is small, is cute, but then pony can grow. Right? <laughs> when pony can grow, uh, it's grow not just not only just grow in size. Right? Once we grow, we have a horn out of us that become a unicorn. <laughs> right? Which which. Hi, but I'm happy to announce we already become a, became a, a, a unicorn the, uh, uh, this, this, this summer. But then, then later on we grow, we, we have 10 horns, then become a Decker coin. That, that's just <laughs> keep on going. So, so that was uh, the secret hope. So what do we do? Uh, essentially, we are responsible for the final product. That's a safe and reliable. But look at the marketplace. Uh, we choose to focus on what we are good at, which is the AI technology, which is the software hardware integration. So what we don't do is we're not manufacturing vehicles. We are collaborating, work with uh, uh, car OEMs, with the tier one suppliers. And then we are not uh, sensor manufacturers either. So we work with uh, LiDAR company, camera company, radar company. So we purchase most of the major hardwares. <coughs> but then we do uh, customized computer chips. We do computer uh, customization. Then we, we collect our own HD map. Then we do all the AI algorithms to make the autonomous driving possible. OK, so what we are now, uh, we actually this is a good time. We, we started exactly two years ago, around this time, uh, December 2nd. So, so in a couple more days, it will be our two-year anniversary. So we started in Fremont, uh, and then we uh, obtained the California open road uh, autonomous driving testing permit uh, in June last year, and started testing in, in the Bay Area. Then we uh, opened a Beijing office in March last year. Uh, one of the uh, milestones that uh, we achieved in Beijing is uh, uh, this year in Beijing, they start coming out with uh, autonomous driving permit as well. But that permitting application process is far more complicated, and far more harder than what's in the California. Right? In, in that testing process, uh, the, our fleet needs to test for more than 5,000 kilometers. And then we have to go through a, a stringent testing, require, uh, testing phase. It's sort of like a how human get our driving license. You pass a different types of tests. And finally, there will be a group of experts that evaluate uh, if the, the technology is good enough. So we, we obtained the highest level of autonomous driving, the T3, so far. And we remain to be the only startup that has obtained that license. Then uh, later this last year, we also opened the Guangzhou office. Uh, in fact, this is uh, the place where we have the largest fleet. And uh, all the videos you have seen so far is actually all in Guangzhou. Uh, because that place has a different weather condition. Has a, 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 it's also a newly built district of the city, so, so it has a lot of interesting scenarios that we can encounter. So, so, so just looking at this is why spreading this for a startup, right? you, you might ask. Right? Essentially, they say startup needs to focus, needs to be concentrated. Uh, but we do see that driving itself is a global phenomenon. And uh, in Asia, especially in China, the autonomous driving definitely is has huge potential. And even purely from technical point of view, uh, it's very beneficial. It's almost like you're learning driving, and you're learning driving in three different traffic conditions simultaneously. So we actually maintain, as I don't know if uh, some of you have a computer-related computer background. Essentially for us, 
we shared the same code base for all three locations. So, so sort of three places all learn how to drive on the open roads, and we can put our learning into the same system. So in that, this is analogous to how humans learn in three different environments simultaneously, so that the, the algorithm, the technology itself, can evolve much faster. On the funding front, uh, we are backed by top investors. Our angel round was uh, supported by Sequoia and IDG. Uh, our A round was closed last year, was, uh, end of last year, was uh, Morningside Legend Capital. And uh, the A plus round was Clearview and A Rose. A Rose is a pure subsidiary of uh, Fidelity. And, w and some other top investors, such as DCM, uh, Red Points, Comcast Ventures, and, and uh, et cetera, all supported us. Uh, in terms of product development, uh, I think the speed and uh, fast iteration is the key. Right? Because essentially, this is uncharted territory. Uh, we don't know what's, it's unlike all the other est established product. There's still a lot of unknowns that needs to be explored. So uh, we think the key, or the speed of iteration is very important. So for us, in the, in the two years in existence, we actually have already uh, launched three versions of our product. The, on the left-hand side, that was the first version we launched in Fremont, and that's the one we used for the uh, California testing permit. Then we start our uh, second generation. In this generation, the noticeable difference from that is the sensor fusion has come into play. Right? Well, how do you understand sensor fusion? Uh, essentially, you can think of LiDAR. As I mentioned, LiDAR used the laser uh, to measure the to accurately, accurately measure the distance. But LiDAR has a drawback. LiDAR cannot detect color, cannot detect texture. And also the resolution is lower, because even, even that big LiDAR is only 64 line. So essentially it emits 64 line and, and just go through like this. Whereas in a traditional camera, right, we know the resolution is high, it has color, it has texture and, and all the good things. But it also has the drawback is that the distance measurement is off, out of luck. So by combining these two, it's more or less like you have a 2D image, but then in most of the pixels, or some of the pixels there, you have accurate distance measurements. So you can think of this way. Or think about the other way is all the LiDAR point cloud has color and it has texture. So by accurately combining these two types of sensors, you, we greatly increased the accuracy of perception. So, so in this version, we start using the sensor fusion. So when you read about sensor fusion, that's really what it means. But also there's a challenge in sensor fusion. Different types of sensors, their time measurements needs to be exactly accurate. Otherwise, they're off. So, so do, for doing so, we actually come up with own computer chips to do the time synchronization. Right? And there are, of course, other uh, challenging algorithms associated with this. And then the, just two months ago, we, we officially launched our third generation, uh, which just by picture you can combine. It's, it's, you can see it's a lot more production product ready right? in terms of not just the the looks, but also the comprehensive of the sensor suites that we put in. Right? Besides the central LiDAR, we also put two small LiDAR in, on the side. This is mostly because we start going into residential area. And uh, in the residential area, there's, uh, there's uh, kids and there's uh, uh, pets that can be very close by to the vehicle, so that we need to do the blind spot detection. Give you another glimpse of, uh, of some of the traffic we deal with, right? This is, uh, uh, we see the, the bicyclist, we try to nudge over, but then there's a big vehicle coming on the right-hand side, and then there's also pedestrian cross the road, and it's a rainy day. So this is the typical situation where, again, you can see we have the uh, nudge, nudge over the bicyclists, 
the big vehicle on the right hand side, pedestrians crossing the road. So this is the daily situations that we need to deal with. So the algorithms need to be robust enough to safely deal with all these traffic situations. What's going forward? I, I think the vehicles, vehicle itself needs to be smart, needs to be safe. But to make this a successful business, there's a lot of other components as, uh, uh, needs to come in. One is the big infrastructure, right? We need to do fleet management. We need to do route optimization. Uh, there's a real-time monitoring and everything else. Besides that, the vehicle needs to be a lot production ready. Uh, and also, uh, a very important factor into this is the uh, UI, is the human-machine interaction. If you are not driving the vehicle, if the vehicle doesn't give you a very intuitive uh, interface to tell you that actually I'm safe, right? Essentially, you say, hey, I have detected that bicycle is beside me. Don't worry about it. So, so essentially, the, uh, we need to come up with a very intuitive UI to tell the passengers to actually give the indication that it's safe. Right? Well, we, we're constantly working on that to add uh, visual cues and also to add some uh, sound uh, indicators. So to save time, I'll, I'll end my talk with, uh, as I said, we launched the third version of our system. We call it, we, we branded it as a Pony Alpha uh, two, uh, two months ago at the uh, Shanghai AI World Conference. The reason we debuted there was that I still remembered, oh gosh, now it's about five years ago, the first time I was rode in an autonomous driving vehicle. I think that all effect, the vehicle can actually drive by itself without the driver. So to me, that I consider as a, as a life-changing event. So I wanted to bring that event, that experience, to a lot more other people. And uh, so happened to be in the AI World Conference, there's a, a big area that can be used to showcase the autonomous driving. So we went there, and during that week, there's more than a thousand passengers rode in our vehicle and experienced that same all effect as I did before. So I end the talk with a video that, that we had in the AI conference.